So I'm Piotr Gwiazda from the English department. Uh, welcome, and I'm here to introduce Lia Purpura, our writer in residence. Um, um, first, I'd like to ask you to silence your phones or turn off your phones, please. Okay, thank you. And um, I would also like, uh, before I introduce Lia, I would like to uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, the Drescher Center for the Humanities and the English <coughs> Department. Uh, this reading is part of the Humanities Forum series of events. Um, I want to encourage you to take a look at other events in the series, um, either on the flyer um, that, that is available um, or at the Drescher Center website. Um, I especially would like to invite you to attend the next Humanities Forum event, um, which will take place on Thursday, March 24th, um, at 4 p.m. Uh, here in this gallery. Um, it's the Evelyn Barker Memorial Lecture, uh, given by Angela Smith, who is a professor of ethics and philosophy at Washington and Lee University, and the title of her talk uh, will be implicit biases, moral agency, and moral responsibility. So that's Thursday, March 24th, 4 p.m. Um, and now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Leah Purpura. Um, for the last few years, she has been teaching at UMBC uh, as our writer in residence. Uh, she's beloved by our students. Uh, many of whom are in attendance today. She's the author of seven collections of essays, poems, and translations. Her awards include a 2012 Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, NEA and Fulbright Fellowships, three Pushcart Prizes, um, work in Best American Essays Anthology, the AWP Award in Nonfiction, and the Beatrice Holy and Ohio State University Press Awards in Poetry. She regularly publishes her poems in prestigious literary journals like Antioch Review and the Paris Review, as well as in general interest publications like The New Republic and The New Yorker. Um, in Leah's new collection, it shouldn't have been beautiful. We find poems with titles like Regret, Sadness, Hope, Desire, Solitude. Poems that are as much about feelings as they are about our attempts, always only the best attempts, to understand them. We also find poems that engage with abstract ideas and concepts, with titles like Distance, or Universal Principle, or one of my favorites, Belief, that are at once deeply philosophical <coughs> and surprisingly lighthearted um, in their embrace of paradox and wordplay. One is reminded of Wallace Stevens nothing that is not there, and the nothing that is. But ultimately, as I have already hinted, these are poems about language, uh, our relationship to it, our everyday efforts to make sense of the world around us, and of the no less mysterious world inside us. The critic Stephen Bird calls Leah's new poems profound, bright, occasionally dangerous. Her sentences shine like amethyst pendants, snap shut like bear traps, and open up underneath like trap doors. Her fellow poet Mary Rofel says, these poems, simple and compact as seeds, yield pleasures as gigantic and wondrous as sunflowers. Uh, it would be difficult to add to or improve upon these analogies. I will just say that I have been reading Leah's poetry 
uh, with great pleasure and admiration uh, for over 10 years now. And I hope you are looking forward to this reading as much as I am. Uh, please welcome Leah Pupura. Thank you all for coming. I'll get all my papers organized. I also would like to thank uh, the Drescher Center and Jessica Berman for inviting me to read this afternoon. It is an honor to be part of the Humanities Forum, a program that is so vital to the imagination and intellect and curiosity um, at UMBC. Thanks, too, to Orianne Smith and my fantastic department, English, for all the ways they support me uh, and support my work. It's a pleasure to work with you all. Um, so I heard there are s some people here who have never been to a poetry reading. Can you reveal yourselves? <laughs> You're so brave. Um, I hope this is new and strange to you. New and strange is exactly what you want from an education. Um, you want to let yourselves be led by curiosity and intrigue and try to stay undaunted by all that you don't know, which is how I pretty much spent my entire undergraduate life, daunted by all I did not know. Um, take a look. I'll. I'll just um, underscore what uh, Piotr said. Take a look at what's going on at the Drescher Center and at UMBC at large, and choose to go to events exactly because you have no idea at all what they're about. That is how you get startled into being alive, by bumbling into things. So it's a very good thing to do. So along the lines of um, bumbling into things, I will talk a little bit about my work and then read from the poems. In both my poems and essays, I'm interested in seeing things that may have gone unnoticed or haven't traditionally merited attention. I'm interested in paying attention to the act of looking itself, an act which is almost always full of contradiction, surprise, and mystery. I'm interested in uncategorizable reactions, moments that I'm convinced are inklings of much bigger questions. And I try to write to figure out my way towards some of those questions. What I'd call beautiful is often a little bit off-center. The objects or instances or beings that feel beautiful to me are often sort of strange, um, usually pretty capacious, the sense of surprise, this off-centeredness, or drive to see a thing slant, uh, become, became a kind of way to proceed with the poems in this book. Um, as you will hear, these poems are really compact. They're about that big. Um, but the compact can be pretty enormous in what it contains. Um, brief things can be cut short things, or tossed off things, or things capped or lopped, or they can reveal an author's skittishness about the supposedly short attention span of the contemporary human. Um, but I think about brevity as a depth experience, rather than one that just responds to the inability to pay attention, or wants to get it over with fast. So in these poems, I liked working with a form that allowed for a lot of space around each poem. I liked the combination of density, layered thought, heightened moment, precise incident, lasered attention. So much that appears to us briefly is marked also by powerful physical sensation. The quick whiff of a scent that throws you back to childhood, an unguarded gesture that reveals someone's authentic feeling, a flinch, a pang, a welling in the chest that accompanies an unexpected emotion, Dickinson's certain slant of light. I tried to pay attention to those physical sensations and write from them, and very much from the body. I like, too, the way 
a very condensed gesture can sort of ring out and can kind of intensify pauses or suspend itself or behave like a joke or a proverb or a riddle, right? Those forms that sort of keep ringing after you hear them. I pay a lot of attention to the natural world in this book and in general. The creaturely world is animate, alive, sentient, vitally engaged in its own goings on, quite apart from us and our need or use for it and our misuse of it. To see into the lives of these individuals, even, in, uh, even if only briefly and sort of sidelong, may be a way for language to repair certain tears in our consciousness, restlessness in our behavior, or violence in our attitudes. So that's a kind of frame for your listening. Uh, and I'm going to try something I haven't done before, but I've heard other poets of very short poems do. I'm going to read a few of these poems twice, um, so you may be able to re relax into them a little bit, you know, and not have that panic, like, oh god, I just missed it feeling. Um, I'll, I'll read, um, you'll know when I'm reading them twice, you'll, you'll get the flow of all that. Okay. So, this first poem. Uh, is called belief. Light, being wavy and particulate at once, is instructive. Why wouldn't other things or states present as both and? For instance, I both believe and can't. Holding these together produces a wobble. I think it's time to take seriously as a stance. So, um, so this poem, this is like physics for poets, right? It's how poets, how poets do physics. Um, and it's always a little nerve wracking when after a reading, an actual, you know, physics person, you know, wanders up. I can't tell you how terrifying that is. Um, uh, there is this sense that, you know, I've, you've got it wrong or you've got some term or you've pronounced something, you know, offensively, but um, apparently this wobble is a physics thing, right? Yes. Thank God <laughs> someone in the front row confirmed it. So I uh, would like you to know, I had no idea the wobble existed. It's one of my favorite words, and I often have to edit it out because I use it so often, um, but there it is, the wobble, in some sort of spin reversal movement thing. And I got it, and that was a kind of, you know, miraculous moment. Um, anyway, I'll read that one again, because physics can be hard. Belief. Light being wavy and particulate at once is instructive. Why wouldn't other things or states present as both and? For instance, I both believe and can't. Holding these together produces a wobble. I think it's time to take seriously as a stance. Um, more and more, I have a sense of being sort of aligned with, or even at one, with the natural world in ways that are newly uncomfortable for me, or ways that make, help me see into the discomfort experienced by the natural world as we continue to impinge on it. Um, and this poem, Loud Walk in Fall, was a kind of extension of consciousness into um, the way a perfectly quiet day might have to receive a lot of disruption. Loud walk in fall. There is something else noise hurts, not just me. Flinching abounds in the open air, 
which hasn't a body, but still is bare and has been walked in on. That truck with no muffler embarrassed it. Um, I am not, I'm, I'm sure, I'm not the only one who feels into the lives of things. It's a comfort that little kids do that and insist that things are alive and real and can be talked to and, you know, talk back. Um, so little kids and poets can have a hard time of it. Um, and this, um, here's one of those diner poems, you know. There, there are certain poems that come on you, come upon you in diners. It's called Sadness Restaurant. A certain kind comes very fast, but unexpectedly, like a feeling about work on behalf of beauty no one devours, those carrot birds, those radish flowers. I eat them just to make them feel better. <laughs> Um, I was having a very interesting conversation with my cousin who is doing uh, his residency in emergency medicine here uh, in Baltimore. You can imagine what he saw there. Um, and we were, he was getting really enthusiastic and um, he said, yeah, it's just, it's just great. And then he paused and he said, I guess I shouldn't have said that. And I said, no, I think, I think I get that. So this is called fluency. To sew the blue burnt edges of a gunshot wound together should require only concentration, training, deftness, ease with systems awry, and how to stabilize. But with good tools, sharp blades, bright lights, I'm guessing a material's qualities become more. Professionals are adept at covering it up, but I'm pretty sure pleasure insists. Um. So this next one is called Ice Shelf, Larson B. That's a particular ice shelf. And um, there, there are a number of things going on in here. Um, I'll read it first and talk a little bit and maybe read it again. Ice Shelf. It's not the kind of seep that puddles, but over time, it should have been millennia. Forces cracks, so even a tiny thaw at the edge indicates a problem, not an abstraction. That is, if it all melts, seas will rise 190 feet. Another fact is sun diamonds up fields of dew in the morning, brightens cuffs of barbed wire, transluces new leaves. Beauty persists, which, as truths go, complicates all we need to know. So one of the joys of, of reading, and reading you know, over decades and rereading, um, is you know, as, a, as, a, as a writer, you find yourself in conversation with other poets. So you might have heard me in conversation with Keats at the end there about truth and beauty and what the heck is going on with those concepts. Um, I think about that issue often um, when trying to figure out really what beauty is and w the ways that it can be you know, deeply strange and complicated. Uh, an oily iridescent gasoline puddle, right? Is that rainbow beautiful or is it awful? 
Is it both? Um, and how do we approach that? So I'm, I'm trying to hold together a lot of, um, I don't know, sort of contradictory ideas here about, about beauty. I'll read that one one more time. Ice shelf. It's not the kind of seep that puddles over time. It should have been millennia. I'm sorry, let me start that again. It's not the kind of seep that puddles, but over time, it should have been millennia, forces cracks. So even a tiny thaw at the edge indicates a problem, not an abstraction. That is, if it all melts, seas will rise 190 feet. Another fact is sun diamonds up fields of dew in the morning, brightens cuffs of barbed wire, transluces new leaves. Beauty persists, which as truths go complicates all we need to know. Um, this next poem is called Rare Moment and it pretty much happened, or the core of it happened, um, when I was talking with a neighbor. And I know I appeared to be a person who was holding a conversation and was present, but I was also a person who was writing a poem at that moment um, in the back of my head. Um, and I think I probably extricated myself from that conversation a little bit too quickly and went back and, you know, apologized to my neighbor and he said, yeah, I figured something was going on. Um, meaning I've seen, I've seen you with your pad and, you know, pen walking down the street. Um, so he had a certain reaction, uh, I had a certain reaction, and the poem in that little interstitial space sort of knitted up. Okay. So, rare moment. A clear choice is so sweet. Not reluctance, but real resistance. Joy to bursting or none. Grief, not gradations. Someone essential and someone not. A good dark strike through versus weighing everything at the end of each day. Look, a cat killed a cardinal on an emerald lawn. For so many reasons, it shouldn't have been beautiful. But that's also the kind of book I like best. Um, I, there are a series of poems in here, which was really surprising to me once I put this um, collection together. And by put together, I mean one sifts out poems across a bed and a floor and then does many forms of rearranging. Um, so it was surprising to me to note how often I was writing about, um, I don't know, sort of changes in technology. Um, I don't think of myself as someone who does that, but it looks like I did. And so here's one of, one of those poems called Net. I want to go back to the way I lived before, when turning, I'd be up against a wall of books, not a room for chats, wanteds, want yous, for sale lists, lists of meetings in space, which is nowhere. A time when I had a pine floor to wander, and boredom was good, a cool drink I took in, so I could return to work refreshed, no hope, just secret negotiations with hope taking place. And here's a little companion one. Devices. Time was different. If it was dead, we filled it with thoughts. Trees along the interstate, we occupied by seeing. And power lines rising and dipping, we wore those by trying on a phrase they necklaced by. 
There weren't so many ways to counter the distance everywhere. It was just fine being human and lonely. Um, the other interesting thing I noticed in putting this collection together was how many arguments between poems were going on and how many poems wanted to speak back to other poems. And um, sometimes they contradicted other poems, sometimes they sort of undergirded or enforced, sometimes they poked at um, and agitated each other. So, you know, all the things you do in conversation, these poems did in conversation. Um, th this one, called Object Desire, it's like a slash object desire, um, feels to me to be in conversation with the first poem I read, Belief. A kind of argument about wanting and getting. Object, desire. I think I don't want it, but then it's right there. I could turn and just grab it, though having would end the now brightened moment so adequate unto itself. I could help things along, look out the window at the green wall of tree upon tree and make that suffice, the distance please, <coughs> which isn't the same as the thing I want then don't want, dear moment I so much don't want to erase. You can kind of count on poets to like leave you in suspension. Right, and, and which is different than dangling or hanging. No hanging, just suspension. I'm okay with suspension. Okay, so um, the phrase redemptive arc was puzzling to me. That that this gesture, that sort of starting here and arcing over, or I don't know, dipping under, you know, results in some sort of redemption, and then what? You go home? So sometimes <laughs> these phrases or language in general um, hits the ear in a way that is, is um, uh, new or strange or uh, suddenly completely odd or wrong or lovely, and um, you hear things like, very, very, very differently. Um, I was joking in a, a class of mine, poetry class, about um, uh, my difficulty in <coughs> pronouncing waistcoat the proper way, which is waistcoat. And um, you know, there's there are all all of these sort of underlying little odd relationships writers have with language. Um, I know how to pronounce it. I just think it's silly. Um, so, anyway, the phrase redemptive arc stuck. Do you know, uh, do you, you might not all know, in old cartoons, there used to be a bouncing ball that you could follow. Do you know what I'm talking about, some of you? Okay, so there, there, if, there, if there was a song at the end of the cartoon, the words came on so you could follow along. But people were so musical that the bouncing ball actually gave you the right inflection, so it would sort of hover when you needed to hold a note and then bounce back along the words so you could sing the song properly if you didn't know it. It was such a great teaching tool. So that's in here. That's what the bouncing ball is in here. <laughs> because, all right, redemptive arc. Maybe more a line cast out that floats on rough water not a frayed and chicken-pecked lasso, which is how a story feels when it tries too hard. Best would be the hovering trail of the bouncing ball that accompanied old cartoon songs whose moves and pauses 
precise, inflected, helped everyone follow along. Okay. Probability. Most coincidences are not miraculous, but way more common than we think. It's the shiver of noticing being central in a sequence of events that makes so much seem wild and rare. Because what if it wasn't? Astonishment's nothing without your consent. So um, I got a letter from a mathematician. And it said in the subject line, note from mathematician. And I thought, as I said, oh god, oh no. And he was very excited about this poem and was writing um, a, a book. And it was about to come out called The Math of Coincidence and Fate, which I thought sounded pretty poetic. And he, he got this poem and, and liked it an awful lot and wanted to use it as the introduction to his book. And I thought, wow, you know, that is the last thing anyone thinks when they're a poet hacking through, you know, issues of probability and what that's all about. Um, and so that was really one of the most thrilling things ever for me, right up there with, like, you know, the ISBN number. So um, it really takes uh, many kinds of knowledge, I think, for the full truth of concepts, the cosmology you know we live with to be told. Um, so poets have, I think, their place in moving through um, certain concepts. I know Emerson said, some, you know, oh, what did he, only the poet knows astronomy or knows the stars, which is, you know, a little heavy-handed. <laughs> we like to think that secretly. Yes, we have it. I'll read it one more time. Probability. Most coincidences are not miraculous, but way more common than we think. It's the shiver of noticing being central in a sequence of events that makes so much seem wild and rare. Because what if it wasn't? Astonishment's nothing without your consent. And uh, I have three more poems for you. When I was in South Dakota a few years ago, I was really shocked at how many features of land were named. There were names, you know, Devil's Tower or, you know, what are like Cougar's Outlook or something like that. And I thought, wow, you know, we live in this landscape that's you know, Baltimore has its little micro neighborhoods. That's kind of our version of it, right? Allegories. That crag in its hunching suggests a shawl under which we can slip our burdens since we alone among creatures bestow likenesses for assurance we really exist and name boulders and peaks widows this widows that, so others might navigate by the forms of our grief. And here's uh, another poem that sort of speaks back to probability. Red Bird in Snow. You can choose to stop short or have it not matter, not weigh the brightness, not hold very still and be known to yourself again. A thing fills with exactly the radiance you accord it. And this last poem is the last poem in the book. I will read it for my department. It is my favorite tense. 
future perfect. <laughs> where you were before you were born and where you are when you're not anymore might be very close, might be the same place, though neither is as slippery as being here, but imagining where you will have been, that point where things land, are finished, over, and gone, but not yet. Thank you very much for coming and listening. Thank you. I am to take questions, should there be any. <laughs> Oh, it's that, that gesture that once you go through all kinds of difficult fictional narrative things, <laughs> you sort of end up, you know, redeemed and okay, so it's like a literary settled. term that yeah. a critic might use or an instructor. Or yes, an instructor. <laughs> Could you say a little bit more about the process, the, about arranging the poetry on, on the bed? Oh, to, yeah. To what extent, how, how, to what extent how, is... How you construct the collection, it, and to what extent does the form, the uh -huh. finite number of pages, sort of determine what you're going to put in? Mm -hmm. First you make the bed, <laughs> and pull all the corners tight, and then you spread out all your poems, um, and, and, and conceive of many different ways of organizing. So, you know, is, is there some sort of story arc? Would you, would you like to um, conceive of certain similar poems in a certain section? Um, are there seasons suggested? That was one way I, you know, thought about this. And then, of course, as mm, certain conversations between poems become clear, um, the, the, the book sort of takes shape around those conversations, and some poems also fall off because of that. They kind of um, get, you know, mm, what's the word? They kind of atrophy out of the, uh, out of the constellation. Um, at that point, it's also very clear whether or not two poems are doing the same kind of work, but one is doing that work better, or more efficiently in terms of the kinds of arguments you're setting up, so another one has to go, which is always sad. They live in a little folder, but it's a green folder, <laughs> so it's bright. Are there moments, though, when you spread them out and say, it's not there yet? Oh, God, yes. Uh, are there, the question was, it's a good question to repeat, or, or part, are there moments when you spread them out on your bed and you think, it's not there yet? Yes, you, you think, what have I been doing for the last three, five years? What is this madness? What were you thinking? <laughs> or, why did you write the same poem four times? <laughs> What was that all about? Did you not see that? So all of your you know, decisions and questions and gestures are really, really clear once you sort of set them out and um, things start crackling and talking to each other and to you. Is that good? I, I'm interested in this notion of brevity. Mm. Um, I don't write poetry, uh, I'm a historian. Uh, but I t tend to write, and people always say, I wish you would say more. Uh -huh. And so I wonder, <laughs> in your poems, do people say that? Yes. And do you <laughs> feel at times constrained? Yes. You write it longer, and then you, I mean, I just want to know more about that. There, there, all of that, I feel that and more. I feel totally liberated writing this short. I feel like, you know what, somebody else can do the epic and someone else can pull their lines apart and you know, spread them you know, over a period of, of pages and make this thing look like a novel. And then I think, good God, Charles Wright does that so brilliantly. Why were you not trying that? And so it, it was, in a sense, a relief to try to pare back as much as humanly possible and to see what kinds of essences I could find without much commentary, but with an, an ear toward the effect of 
um, density or the effect of um, really quick movement toward a certain you know point. Um, and I am, you know, that was the project of this book. I have no idea if I will sustain this or if the next collection will be, you know, super long lines or narrative in some way. Um, the other answer to the question is that I write essays also. And while these poems seem to behave like very small essays with, you know, little rhetorical ideas <coughs> or narrative ideas, the essays tend to behave like very long poems. So they're written in sentences, but there's, you know, there's, th there are poetic gestures and um, atmospheres in those essays that kind of take care of a certain lyric, you know, musculature that I'm, I, I need. Um, so there's a kind of balance there. Um, and, you know, one always has, you know, grave doubts about the thing they've just finished and, and often the response to the thing you've just finished and the gestures you've just made is to undergo an in oh, incredibly easy period of, you know, rubber banding, you know, sort of back to some other kind of gesture. So that, that all might happen as well. Sure. Um, the compact nature of your poems in this book, uh, after writing it as uh, do you, did you have any takeaways after like focusing on the style for, uh, for a whole book length? Um, could you say more about takeaways? What do you mean? Like, you were focusing on the style specifically, and um, I would like to know, like, um, after writing, uh, after finishing the book, mm -hmm. like, what, what did you get from it after, like, because you, you did it for a reason. You, you focused on uh, writing uh, in a compact nature for a reason. Mm -hmm. Was interested in what you got from mm -hmm. I think what I got was a sustained period of a couple of years of um, thinking in this way and apprehending my own um, responses to the world in this way. So it was almost you know as if I were, you know had a little road that I built and things moved um, experience, emotion, idea moved onto that road very quickly and had a form to sit in to travel by and that was completely thrilling because I you know I could feel very very clearly when something um, snapped in the world or lit and became idea and there was a form compactness to hold that already so it was like you know the, it was the joy of working with a series and and knowing your format in a sense so if you imagine, you know, a photographer working in, you know, some enor you know, enormous series, you start to see things um, and make things and look for things that will fill a particular f frame. And so I think, you know, the joy of, of being in that kind of relationship was tremendous, you know. I'm cut loose and untethered and floating around and, you know, like some sad astronaut right now <laughs> you know I want back to some mothership and I'm you know I have to I have to figure that out post book is always kind of traumatic mm-hmm I noticed that you um I noticed that you um favor sort of sort of um abstract metaphors and some are admittedly a bit dumb and some I will admit are a bit hard to follow do you ever do you um have you ever read um, the Have you ever read uh, the, the, the Book of Changes or the Classic of the Way by any chance? The The Book of Changes, like the I Ching. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not surprised. That's because. really interesting because I haven't looked at the I Ching for a very long time, but I I I think if you're making some connection. Yeah, that sort of abstract. Yeah. The sort of abstract free verse. Mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. both that both um, the the each the uh, Yijing and the Da De Jing. Yeah, I think that's a really really nice connection. Thank you. Do you, do you ever wonder in how much you do you ever wonder if you write in, in that way because or in those short couplets because of the influence perhaps of either of those texts? You know that the the issue the larger issue of influence and you know how you're taken up by what you've read in your life is so mysterious really really mysterious. Um, very hard to track. Um, it's a question that we're all asked, you know, often. Who are your influences? 
<laughs> just this wall comes down. Um, they're there. They work themselves out. Often other people can see them. Um, and it's, it's, hard, it's hard to call up in any way that makes sense. Yes? Um, what, what like, method do you use to quantify like, who is a writer and how do you consider yourself a writer? When did you, when did you start <laughs> as though you were a writer? And then what makes a person a writer? You mean like the moment on my 17th birthday when I stood up and, and you know, the the um, uh, the light like beamed down and vibrated my head into poetdom that moment. That's exactly it. Yep. What does that mean as a title to you? I'm not a writer personally, unless I'm I'm doing the work, um, and doing the work can mean that I'm walking through the world, you know, taking notes, um, or I'm reading really hard and taking notes and making word lists. Um, for me also, it means I'm, I'm pretty diligent about it and I sit down to it every day, more or less. Um, so there is a combination um, of, of having to walk through the world as a writer, which is something I really, want to give to my students, not, you know, a sense that you must become this, you know, as a viable job option, um, but that y there are ways to walk through the world that um, are artistic and allow for a deeper, grander, more intense experience of being alive, right? So that's sort of what I, I teach toward. Does that answer it? Yeah. Great. There was no moment at 17. <laughs> Good. That's it. Thank you so much. It's great. <laughs>